Welcome to the Protein Bros Podcast. On today's episode, we have Wes Hamilton. Wes is the founder of the company Disabled But Not Really. It is a non-for-profit that helps people who are disabled get accustomed to life with a disability and also get back into fitness. He has a truly remarkable story. At the age of 24, he was shot, which left him paralyzed. And um, his outlook on life is so inspirational. He, he hasn't felt bad for himself one bit. Um, but today we talk about on the podcast basically what it takes to rehab from an injury like that and what life looks like after dealing with an injury like that. It was a great conversation. I think you guys are going to love it. If you guys haven't already, like, share, subscribe this episode, and let's get to it. Wes, you have started taking to fitness, and this was after this fatal injury. Right. This well, it's not fatal. Fatal. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Horrific. <laughs> Let's rewind that. Horrific injury. <laughs> He's like, I'm start. not dead. <laughs> Came back to life, yeah. but I'm here. Yeah. yeah. And this was from, uh, so paralyzed from the waist down, correct? T- yeah. Tell us the was story, that, man. Yeah. Tell us that story. And, and was that instant? Um, You said, was it instant? Yeah. Did you feel that instant? I mean, for the lack of a better phrase there. All right. So... I guess the best way to do it is to put it in context. Um, it was a verbal altercation that happened between me and an ex-girlfriend of mine. Um, and it was really just just like any other argument. The difference was there was somebody in our house, and it was a male. Uh, he never came out. But I would like to say that who I was back then, I definitely had like this little man complex i'm like five four five five on a good day so um i just felt like i needed to stand my ground and i think uh that just made the situation intimidating uh, i fast forward a little bit a little bit more confronting things um and this gentleman had come out by this point nope so it was just me and uh, the ex-girlfriend still kind of just going back and forth. Um, the situation was pretty hostile. It, was, it became so hostile that I ended up calling a friend of mine over. Um, I was just pretty naked. If people don't understand what that means, I just didn't have anything to protect myself. And, again, I didn't feel the need to leave. Um, I was just trying to figure out what, what was going on. Um, and this was... Uh, a relationship of several years. So um, my friend came over and then the individual came out the house. Um, and that was because they knew each other. So a conversation happened. The situation died down. Um, and I thought everything was good. It actually was, at least from me and the individual. The difference was he had already made his phone call for his own source to come as well. So as we were just in the mix of a conversation and trying to figure things out, the person that he called was just looking at the situation. As I was walking back to my car, um, I was shot. And so I didn't see the person. I didn't even know somebody had got called or somebody was coming. Um, the environment we was in was an apartment complex um, in South Kansas City. Um, it was kind of like a one-way in, one-way out type of drive driveway thing. Um, and so, just so you can kind of so, it was and it was a, it was a decent day outside. It was January fourteenth, two thousand ah, January fourteenth, two thousand twelve. How old are we at this time, Wes? I had just turned 24. It was actually my birthday weekend, five days after my 24th birthday. And um, I just remember walking back to my car, and I didn't know I was shot. I just knew something happened. Like, time stopped. Definitely stopped. Uh, what people would probably refer to my body went in instant shock. I ended up reacting in a sense of turning in a direction that maybe I heard the sound. Maybe I just knew to turn in that direction. But when I did, I was looking at somebody I never knew. Um, but it wasn't in a sense of 
just confusion. It was definitely staring at the barrel of a gun held by somebody I didn't know. And before I could react in any way, I was shot again. That was the bullet that paralyzed me. Uh, because that was the moment my body dropped. And I remember just dropping and hitting the ground. And, of course, we're in this environment where you have families and things because it's an apartment complex. So there are people coming out. Like, I remember, like, a little bit of panic. Um, I remember a couple people coming up and maybe putting pressure on the wounds. Again, I'm still kind of, what just happened? What is going on? Yeah. Yeah, like, (laughs) I mean... I've lived, I I definitely lived a life where I was aware of situations like this, but maybe I just didn't, it didn't come to how quick it could happen. Right. You, or you never think it's going to be you. Yeah, it yeah, never happens to you. Thing. Yeah. Not at all. But also you just hadn't been in those situations yet in your life, right? No, I had been in something. Right. <laughs> I was definitely not the best person at this time. Um, but I can say that it was just, I was, I was very surprised. I was definitely surprised. And I remember just when I when I when I realized that okay, I'm shy, something's happening. Um let me back up a little bit for you. I hit the ground and before like a lot of the panic, um there was actually a shootout. So the person that shot me started shooting at my friend as well. They go back and forth. Um, cause I was still in, I, I, at this point I'm in fear. Cause not only do I, I'm assuming that he not done, right. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I done put other people in the predicament. Um, and it ended kind of quickly and they got in their car, separate cars. And I remember just because as I, uh, I'm laying down and I'm not able to move, I'm concerned and thinking I'm about to get ran over, right? So I had all these thoughts going on just in the midst. It was so much happening. Um, but it seems like it was kind of slow for you, too, in yeah, a weird way. It was. It definitely, you know, time stopped. If you're thinking, it, I don't want to get ran over, it's like, bro, you just got shot. <laughs> like, I'd have been, like, freaking well, out. Well, I just thought it was, again, I'm out, I think for me it was the adrenaline of, like, it's not done, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I just grew up in a sense where, I think the reality that I've always known is like you just finished a job, mm-hmm. right? And so if I'm laying there and this individual still like it just yeah, it happened so fast in many ways when it came to time. <laughs> but it was very slow and eventful as I kind of projected. Uh-huh. Um and so again, you get to the point where people are around, they're holding the like putting pressure on my wounds. Um I got someone that comes over and stands over me and prays with me um i'm i'm thinking it's my reality i'm dead right like i don't think like there's hope to live like at the end of the day i grew up thinking i would be dead or in jail by the age of 21 that was really my reality i was blessed to be 24 and the only regret i had was that i had just got sole custody of my daughter she was two at the time so i just and my mind was just like, man, I can't be a father. I just got custody of her. Like, where is she going to go? Like, I definitely had those thoughts. But I didn't think about, like, oh, man, like, I should be living any longer. Like, I was just like, yep, this is it. You know, just write it off. Um, and I remember, like, when my friend came back over to me, he looked at me and kind of I would had one of them bro moments, you know. It's real. It's real. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I looked at him and I was just like, yeah, bro, I'm about to die. I remember saying that, and I remember his response was just like, I know. Uh, We didn't really know how to, like, cope with it. Of course, someone had already called, like, 911. Um, And I remember being up until they arrived. Um, I remember just all of it until I got to the hospital. Um, And it's it's funny, y'all, because, I mean, of course, it's not a funny situation, but when I look back at it, it was very eventful. You know, I got I, on a ride to the hospital. They, like, I asked them what hospital I was going to go to. They tell me it had bad history of people dying there. So I was like, man, I'm going to die anyway. I'm in, I'm, you know, I'm like, 
this is not really like helping me. Like e- even if you take me to the hospital, I just don't feel like this is the safest place for me to just think I'm gonna survive. Um, and it's then like all these things are, are popping up are just not ideal. Do I they? Really just, do they? When you get put in a uh, an ambulance like that, did they give you a shot of like morphine or anything to like I, chill honestly, the pain? I feel like they did a lot. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because of course they was cutting down my shirt and doing all. Well, I'm different. sure they were like putting, you know, that powder on it that stops bleeding. Um, and see, none of that process is something I remember. Yeah, I definitely feel like it was more like maybe just your head. You just kind of out of it. You just kind of looking drifting, and they just operating. And because you know you're full of adrenaline, that nothing's really you feeling it. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel getting shot. Um, I didn't feel the pain of a bullet going through and piercing my skin. I actually just knew something had happened. It was the pain happened afterwards. The pain happened, you know, waking up. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the moment, body went into shock, and you just—I mean, it's crazy. But so, so you you got shot in the back, like um, you got shot directly in the spinal cord, or how, what? Where did the bullet go in? Or so, the two bullets. So I got shot in my abdomen. Mm-hmm. Um, so literally, just thinking, walking back from the um, back of your car to the driver's side, it was literally like that angle from like that trunk space, and mm-hmm. that's where I was shot. And I was shot like the first bullet kind of went up in my chest, um, and then the other one was like directly in my abdomen, on the side there, right? On the side, and that's the one that actually made you drop. Yeah. So. We get to the hospital, um, and you said you had people, you know, from the apartment complex are all coming down. Everybody's helping you as far as like trying to hold the hold pressure on the wounds until the ambulance arrives. Mm-hmm. And you have this conversation with your bro, with your bro, and he's like, "Man, I know about you passing." And then, like he wasn't like, "You're not going anywhere." He was like, "You'll probably, you're probably." He was giving up. You're saying in that moment. I think it was more me giving up and him just trying to put you at peace, or. I think we just never considered how do you like, do you have hope in this situation? I mean, again, I'm born and raised on the east side of Kansas City. And until I was maybe 15 or 16, I didn't even think I could go outside of like 75th Street. Um, And so within that time, we lost a lot of people. And some situations you just kind of started being immune to it. And I think even that day, like, we were just, we had, we were just, yeah, it was a norm for us. So it wasn't really, like, giving up. It was just, like, this is life. Like, we live for this. Like, we definitely live to die. And, unfortunately, we have believed probably through our whole life that this is the way that we die. Sure. Is, uh, you know, now that you've you've basically transcended and, and gotten yourself to, you know, a place that, probably a lot of people that grew up around you could only dream of getting to, you know, when you look back at that situation and that mindset of growing up in a situation like that, you know, do you have hope for, you know, the violence that surrounds that area to ever get better? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just think, um, I mean, I, I I'd up, say I, violence <coughs> surrounds America, you know, like it's, it seems like it's everywhere now. You no, know? it, I mean, it's definitely everywhere, but when you look at just the inner city, you, you, you learn about how things are systemically placed, you know, how certain designs are implemented. Everyone has a, a kind of like a story within their family and, and, you know, unfortunately, like on the east side of Kansas city, everybody's story is the same. Um, and it's, it's just lack of a lot. Resources, leadership. I look at myself and think of how did I serve myself to be who I am? And then can someone else do that? And I believe so. And I believe that the things that help me become who I am today are definitely the things that aren't provided into those communities. And so, yeah, there's hope. But it's also do. In a sense, do the people that's in power want to see that actually change? For Cause, sure, because that's where is that, that's also where it lies. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of benefit you you gain from communities that I'm from. You know, rather the violence, like it's definitely a bad thing to look at. It's you know you you see it 
have an effect like the Chiefs Parade. Right, mm-hmm. like it starts to go outside of the community if there are bigger events and situations. Um, but there's also a lot of there's just value, unfortunately, and it's not value for us, but we definitely see the value. Rather, it's the cost of land, mm-hmm. the school systems, you know, like literally seeing how those communities are being built up on, but those individuals are now being pushed out. And so it starts to create this this confusion to a community that still has to find an identity. So I think that, yes, change can happen, but we have to really be mindful that we got to go and plant seeds that was never planted and then find ways to water it and not just think that they're going to grow on their own. For sure. What steps um, do you feel like we're taking as a city to make that happen? Um, I think that we definitely, you know, I know that we do a lot of talking. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, I don't know how, you know, the kind of job that, you know, Slay did before Lucas or which one you prefer or whatnot. But, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear your, you know, your interpretation of it all. No, I mean, I definitely feel like for the people that are in a position to create change or try to find better ways of um, how we can make the city better. I think they're just doing a lot of conversations around it and not a, enough action. Um, I mean, you have to think about, I have to put the Chiefs Parade in reference, but when you think about our police chief just saying this is in Kansas City, there's crime and violence every day in certain areas in the city. You cannot say that this isn't something that is an issue. You know, we were at the top rate of the murder rate last year. Um, and that was. A yeah, big- but it's almost like, but don't think about that. Like, yeah, that's that doesn't count. It's kind of like the perception that I got when he was talking about that. You know, oh, this was a female, though, or whatever. Right. Yeah. The, but that's what it is. It's like, but to me, it's like that's the tale of two cities. And so some people, again, are speaking from the benefit of how do we make this safe? But then the safe, the safety is only coming in certain areas. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll make the plaza safe. We'll make, you know, Union Station, Crown Center. And again, I definitely want those areas safe, too, because that's where I like to be able to take my family and do things. But when I'm having a barbecue at my grandma's house, I need that area safe, too. Mm-hmm. Right. Like because that's where I'm from. And so I can't keep my like migrating to other areas that feel like a safe place. We need to be able to create this community over there to give the resources and the access and the privileges of what is what is lifestyle look like because it's that's the difference is that people don't understand what lifestyle they see struggle Mm -hmm. and so when you see struggle like you see and then you get jealous of when you see life right you see people that are flourishing or thriving and you can't like it's not their fault they just figured out a path or a system or have one Mm -hmm. and then you have another community of people that don't have one so it's like it starts in the education you saying crabs in the bucket like those communities are like they almost like uh, if somebody tries to get up and out, they they're almost like uh, screw that person, you well, know. Well, I think it's it's also it's <clears throat> when you're trying to people have to be invested in change in a way that they they're kind of putting their heart and like they're all into it. Like you like when you're when you're focused on actually changing the trajectory of anything. You mm-hmm. got to be invested. Like you can't just make it sound good. It can't just be tokenized. Yeah, activist is uh, the the phrase, right? And, <laughs> and activist, uh, you know, short for act. You know, absolutely. You can't just be talking about it. No, and I and I think that that's where the 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 mentality comes in because we have a lot of people that can make it out of certain spaces, but they don't come back and plant the seeds for individuals, other individuals to come out. It's definitely an issue, right? And I feel like even my situation itself was an issue. But if you kind of fast forward real quick, just because we're talking about violence, a healed person isn't becoming a threat to someone else. And so I I look at myself again as someone that thrives. I definitely feel like I thrive, but I am grateful for life. I'm not mad that I was shot. And the fact of that, I was even, you know, I had the opportunity to meet the person that shot me. And I got to sit across from him like we're doing today and tell him how grateful I was for him doing what he did. 
it wasn't necessarily just praising the individual. It's saying that through this situation, I grew. And the life that I have now would have never happened if you didn't do this to me to, in a sense, to wake me up. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, like so when I look at my life, I look at my story, I look at how I can say thank you to somebody that changed the trajectory of my life. I look at a community of people and think if we learned more empathy, if we learned more compassion and kindness and how to control our emotions. Twelve years ago, I couldn't say that. Right, I sit across and think retali retaliation was the the yeah, goal. What do you got to do? Yeah, right, the only answer there. But now it was like, no, nah, man, I want to give you some love because I'm not trying to mess up this life that I worked so hard to create. Right, but it's so many people that never put in the work to create the life that they want, so they are upset because of the circumstances they live in. And so for me, it's the fact of not really just looking at someone's life that is better. It's looking at someone's life and seeing the work that they're doing every day to keep it at a quality that they prefer because you can live and I can live under my circumstances. I'm paralyzed from the waist down. I easily could adjust to these circumstances, but every day I wake up, I'm like, Nope, I'm actually going to rise above my circumstances. I'm going to do what I didn't think a person in a wheelchair could do. And rather it's the cars I drive, the way I travel, or just the people I speak to. I'm never going to put myself in a position to be more of what my situation is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people, no matter where you are, no matter what background you are, right? Like that's people that settle for, you know, not choosing a healthy lifestyle, right? Like in the sense it's, it's, I just don't want to put the work in, but I can't, you can't be jealous of somebody being on stage, getting real good in shape and posing. If you ain't did the work, but it, they had it easier. They had better genetics. They, they didn't have to work <laughs> as hard. They, you know, they had all, they just used a bunch of steroids. Like these are the things that I feel like a lot of people tell themselves. No, nah, see, right? listen, I was 24 when I was paralyzed and I was about 250 pounds, five, four. And to this day, I'd be, completely honest and say that I believe that I was big boned it. I didn't think that I could lose weight. I had adjusted to my circumstances. It wasn't about genes. It wasn't about anything. It was just the fact that I didn't have the will to get out of the situation that I was looking in, in the mirror. That's what I believe because once I took control paralyzed and all my whole life changed, I didn't go sloppy, you know, fit. I went fit like fit fit. Like I didn't even think that I could be that fit. So for me, that's the, that's the importance. When we think about like that, that when people don't have the will <laughs> to pull something out of themselves, then they come up with excuses. I'm the representation of change. And if you can't, if you don't look at my story and say, like, I can't do excuses. I don't care because I made all the excuses until every excuse was something I had to look at in the mirror. And it was like, well, dang. And now I, the only other excuse I could say is I can't, but I can. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. But now no one else, able-bodied or not, can tell me what you can't do. Because my whole life I thought I was going to be big. And then I go get, <laughs> become healthy. And all I did was change the way I ate. I didn't do nothing extra. Did the did the f switch flip for you like when you were doing PT or like when was this? Was it like directly after you yeah. got shot? Like H how long was the? Uh, did you go into depression yeah. afterwards? You know because like that's something that you know I would guess it would be a common thing. Yeah, when did you start picking yourself up after that event? No, absolutely. Like nothing happens overnight. I had to adjust to being paralyzed. I mean, society in itself doesn't really amplify. The, the, the beauty and disability. That's the best way I can put it. There's not a real, there's not a lot of positive representation in that field. So if someone's life changes tomorrow, your representation might be something that's defeating mentally for you. So for me, I thought a person in a wheelchair is supposed to be overweight and depressed. Like that's what I had always saw. Um, so that was my life. And then on top of that, like my feet would always swell, things like that, like at the beginning of my injury. So I couldn't put on my fresh J's. So that like took my confidence away. I'm like, man, I can't even dress no more. So I went and bought some uh, shoes from Walmart, little Velcro shoes, because my feet was so big. Uh. <clears throat> 
And it was like, that was what I settled with. Now, did that, did that um, do something good for me? Not really. It made me adjust to a lifestyle that I didn't want to be a part of. The power in my story is that I got so custody of my daughter about three months before my injury. She was two. So as I'm trying to kind of reject this lifestyle, I still have to be a father. Um, and through that process, I actually ended up being put on bed rest for 21 hours a day for two years. So the first year, so I'll just say a quick timeline. January 2012, going to January 2013, I'm trying to get back to who I used to be. I'm trying to make myself relatable to my peers, right? Person in a the wheelchair, they don't know how to adjust to yet. So I'm fighting for them to know their old West, right? I'm hopping in the car, moving around like I could do this. Well, that actually caused me to have some serious health complications to the point where the doctors told me I had to be on bed rest for 21 hours a day. Um, and the only way that I could actually get off of that, become an active father like I was aspiring to be, was to add more protein to my diet. Because I had wounds that wasn't closing, and wound, protein was a good healer for wounds. <clears throat> I didn't know how to do that. I mean, I come from a community, food deserts, you know, the reference, all these different things. How am I supposed to, And I thought I was big boned. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, protein, how do you do that? It was a foreign language to me. The difference, again, I'm a father. I got my little girl in the other room. And as a, as a man, I had never thought that I would, you know, want my daughter to see the weak, like my weakness, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and so I'm, I'm at the weakest point of my life at this moment, but I can't let her see it. So I was going to do what I need to do. Um, and so it's always a light bulb moment, right? The doctors didn't tell me to add protein to my diet for months, and I still ain't did it. I thought a double quarter pounder with cheese or something was going to do the job, to be honest. Um, but I was getting out of my hospital bed one day after a routine checkup and uh, just transferring over to my wheelchair. And my daughter looked at me. She's about three and three. She's about three. And she just said, Daddy, you're getting in your Superman chair. And. I joke about it because I'm like, man, I'm a Batman fan. Like, I just feel all like, when did she watch Superman? Like, it was all these thoughts, like, in my mind. But it was, it was that moment for me. Like, you know, when you acquire a disability, sometimes a lot of the, the fear or the lack of confidence that you gain is based off of your, the people mm -hmm. around you. You're really focused on their perception of you now. And so for me, I, I lost confidence because I didn't feel like no one saw me the same. But my daughter saw me as Superman. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where a lot happened. Because now I knew that I needed to show her this strength. I always say, like, she put a cape on me when I was at the weakest point in my life. Like, I was literally going through it 21 hours a day at bed rest. Like, it wasn't good. But I needed to be Superman. So once I left there, that was it. I said, all right, I got to take control. I got to figure this out. So I took up a, a dietitian course at Johnson County Community College. And one, it was about a 30-minute drive from my house. So I was like, okay, this can get me out, make me breathe fresh air, um, go to a campus, like try to be social. Like I got to adjust to this. Mm -hmm. um, I learned food in a way that, like changed everything for me. Like the fitness was cool, but the food was it because it was like, I never understood how valuable food was like how that man, when I got injured, I'm on 14 meds at this time too. Right. I got medicine for everything. So I start eating, right. I didn't do a drastic change. I applied water. I took away the Dr. Pepper. I was drinking every day. I started drinking water. Then I just made substitutes. All right. Well, I was do, using regular noodles. Let me go whole wheat. Right. Like all right, I was using lettuce. Let's change it. Use spinach or kale or something like that. It was literally simple changes, but I did it consistently. My last surgery was January of 2015, three years after I was injured. I love my 
I love my timeline. <laughs> I had did this practice for about a year, and I could never weigh myself, right? There's no way you can really weigh a person in a wheelchair. It's a process. So the easiest way for us to get weighed is to get in the hospital bed. So I have friends and family like, well, you getting small like that. <laughs> like, okay, cool, you know. But I'm in denial. I mean, I was big boned. You can't tell me I'm losing weight. Like, I believe that many people that are probably watching this, I get it. I get it. <laughs> big boned, I get it. You know, you don't think that you have it? I got it. I believed all that. I did. So I was in denial even when people were telling me that I was small. I went from a size 44 pant. I'm in a 36, and I'm still thinking I'm the same size. I got in that hospital bed, and the doctor told me I was 135 pounds. All I did was eat. I couldn't work out. I was on bed rest. All I did was change what I ate, and I was determined to do it. I mean, I was so determined where I was meal prepping, all of this, right? I mean, I was watching the Food Network. I learned how to cook everything. I mean, I felt like I was a chef on just being self-invested into myself. I lost 100 pounds in less than a year, paralyzed. I couldn't do that walking. At that point, I understood that whatever I wanted to put my mind to and the life that I wanted to create, I could do it. And I also understood that I had started to fight all of the challenges that I faced as a kid. I looked at how I adjusted to circumstances because my lack of confidence because of my weight. Even though I adjusted and accepted it, I was definitely not confident with it. And so in order for me not to be a kid that was teased, I chose a negative lifestyle where I could be the person that you didn't want to tease. And now... When this shift happened, I'm laying in this hospital bed, and I'm so grateful and full of life that I don't feel negative. That's when I was like, why should I be mad about this position? Like, I did something I couldn't do walking. And then I started my nonprofit organization. I literally laid in the hospital bed, and the first thing came to my mind was, not, oh, Wes, let's go out here, man. You, I did think I was, like, very skinny. I'm like, you skinny now, <laughs> right? Like, it wasn't that. It was, how can I help other people that had the same thought as me when they first got injured, that life was over? Because now I just knew I could do every, any and everything, and a doctor hadn't even cleared me to get off bed rest yet. And I, had, I took a picture of myself, and I hashtag disabled but not really. And I had a lot of, a lot of great comments when I hashtagged that, and I just... Figured out how to set a nonprofit up while I was in the hospital bed, and the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, in that way, from that story, it's almost like your disability became a superpower for you. Because, you know, how many people would love to lose 100 pounds, you know? Absolutely. And it's like, it's just, sometimes you have to go through a circumstance that's, you know, you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy to, to make you realize, like, you have all the power in the world. Yeah, like, life is going to test you. Yeah. And I was just tested. I believe that the work that I'm doing today, I believe that the things that have led me to this work was a plan. I don't look at my life as something that I regret. I don't look at anything that I did in the past as something that I regret. Why? Because my experiences create a level of empathy. And it allows me to serve and go into communities that other people might not feel like they can fit in that I can make my story relatable because it is still authentic. The only thing I did was grow myself. I didn't change myself. I changed my mindset. And so for me, it's like that value that I hold. Like I'm, I always tell people, <clears throat> I always tell people, I can go out and listen to Nipsey Hussle, ride around in my car, and then I can go give you a 60-minute keynote on how to take control of your life. Like I don't care about the influences that, <coughs> I'm surrounded by it because it's still who I am as a person. Yeah. That's how I came and I was brought up. But at the same time, I'm very mature where I get to choose what I want to do in life. And I get to choose positive over negative, good over bad, right over wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the story that you have about, you know, not understanding food. And then when you finally first like started to, to understand food is just a, a good highlight of how bad our educational system really is. You know, I've said for a long time that, you know, it should be mandatory that we have classes on like 
how to not get obese. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like not, not a nutrition class, like specifically here's what the macronutrients are. Here's how to count your macros. Here's how, here's the foods that are, that are calorie dense. Here's the ones that are hyper palatable here, you know, that you need to be careful of because they become addicting, you know, all of that needs to be like constructed into a class and, and distributed to Americans because obesity epidemic is continuing to rise. And I feel like, you know, it takes you going into a, a college class to like really break through mm-hmm. and into something that all of us should have understood from the time that we were little. If we were actually, tra- <coughs> I think that just goes back to what you were saying. It's like, we know that there's a problem, but like, are the people that are in charge really even giving a shit about fixing that problem? It, it, so anybody can look at a book and open it up on nutrition, but yeah. you, I think you have to be able to see something that can actually shift your mindset, right? It has to be a change factor. Mm-hmm. For me, I grew up where, you know, you have tea, do tea and sugar or Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, or flavor egg. <laughs> right? Yeah. And um, what I would do is... Um, I looked at so I looked in a nutrition book and what really caught my attention was the the sugar cubes because they 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 show you how many cubes are in a uh, soda yeah right and I started looking and it was like the can of soda was like so many cubes predominantly sugar <laughs> <laughs> and then you got all the way up to the big boy that I'm consuming every day and I'm just like. It, it really just put a dis like a distaste in my mouth. Like I was, I, it didn't make me proud to consume that much. And I think visually you can read something and you can say, oh, well, if it says 38 grams of sugar, oh, 38 grams of sugar. You need to see that through the cube. Yeah. Right? It's almost <laughs> like if you say 38 you grams of sugar, it's like you, you don't, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, there's nothing to it. No one knows what a gram it. of sugar looks like. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right. Unless you done did something in life. But <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk about, you know like, what an ounce of sugar looks like, <laughs> right. you know, like quarter ounce of sugar. There's a, you know, we, I think this also goes back to like the intentionality of how we're teaching the kids. Right. So, You know, my health classes were in seventh grade, I remember. And it was like when you were going through puberty, you got all these changes going on in your life. And then they they teach you about, you know, cholesterol and blood pressure and calories. But it's never put through the lens of um, how these change the way you look Mm -hmm. or how they make you feel. And so it's all from a general health perspective. And it's all very um, abstract versus it being like directive towards your lifestyle that you're living at that time. And so I always think like it's like, you know, every kid just really cares about, you know, um, from an aesthetic standpoint back then, like, well, how do I get abs? Because abs is like whatever guy thinks in their head they need to have. They're going to be in quotes in shape. Or how do I perform better at a sport? Um, You know, another concern for young people. No one's thinking like, oh, I got to make sure I have low blood pressure. Yeah. I got to make sure my cholesterol's down. You know what I'm saying? And so it's just like, I wish they would just tell you direct, like what Kyle just said, like how not to be obese would be a great class, you know? Versus like, we're just going to teach you about what these all are and then let you decide how to, how these add up to what you're wanting to do. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The, 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 when you're teaching a kid about blood pressure or any of those things, it's like, you know, I'm 36 and I recently just started really caring about longevity. You know, I think that people go through phases where, like you were saying that, you know, you, you, you're more worried about aesthetically, how do I look when you're younger? And it's like, if you want a kid to understand nutrition and actually pay attention to what they're eating and and educate them, you have to look through the prism of a kid, you know, and they're just not going to care about blood pressure. Like no matter what you say, they're not going to care about concerned with it all. Yeah. As they shouldn't be. But their kids. Yeah. So I don't know. That's, that's just one of those things where, you know, when you said that, I think we all have had that moment where you kind of, you know, everything starts to click for you for like when it comes to diet and you almost feel like, man, why am I just now learning this? You know, for me that I was probably like 24, 25 when I got really into nutrition and I felt like, why am I learning this on my own? You know, I've had, you know, tons of nutrition classes throughout the years. 
like you were saying, all of them based around, you know, blood pressure and, you well, know, this more like is vocab terms and they are about applicable. Yeah. Yeah. Life. You're, you're, you're basically just <laughs> filling in like, you know, you're passing a test or yeah, you're ways. passing a test and you're not really learning anything. And, um, yeah, I just think that as a country, if we're going to, you know, lower the obesity epidemic, it's going to have to start with, you know, like some kind of class where it's just, here's how to not be fat, you know? But then you, you look at, I mean, to take the elephant out the room, you look at America and other countries, and there's definitely an issue, you know, and a lot of people that don't travel might not ever see it. But when you start to travel, or just going to different areas within America. Like, I stayed in L.A. for two years. I mean, there was so much activity happening. <laughs> like, every day somebody, like, if D- someone wasn't culture. working out, I definitely didn't didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, everybody was doing something. It was amazing. Cultural it, there. Yeah. Late, late nights, everybody going for walks. I mean, it was just, it was so different. So, I think, like, you don't have to go far, but you should go outside of your community and your area to be aware of how other people are taking care of their lives. Like go to the richest, you know, uh, the city or state with the highest economy, you know, and, and wealth and see how people are living there. I mean, there's a lot of benefit and privilege in what I just said when it comes to wealth and economy, but at the same time, like people take care of themselves. And when you get to be able to see that, you just start to be conscious. A lot of people are just, you can't get away from what tastes good. Mm-hmm. You can't get away from what tastes good. That's it. It's a thousand one excuses, but that burger from Culver's is amazing, right? Like if you go to Freddy's, I'm telling you, I know it's good. But you have to worry about what's actually how you want to live and how long you want to live. And when you just take the time to eat smart and see how that does for your body, like you remember when I was on 14 meds, I don't take any meds today. I haven't took meds in years. Um, I'm actually, I believe that I'm one of the healthiest people that I know, despite my my injury. Like, during COVID, like, I was just good. I didn't care. Like, I didn't. I mean, I definitely felt like my immune system, everything, and I took the proper precautions. But for someone with the disability and thinking, like, you have to be sick or the direction, it's like, no, you just have to be healthier. You have to be more conscious of what you put in your body. I can eat the same thing three times in a day, but I don't feel bad. Mm-hmm. Like I feel good and I eat a lot. You know, like when you start eating good, like you eat a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, dang, I got to consume all of this, but. Yeah, you tell somebody they got to eat 200 grams <laughs> of protein. They're like, okay. And then they try and do it. And they're like, that's a lot of protein. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. You know, as far as like the different areas in the United States, it seems like obesity is worse in areas where food is more culturally relevant. You know, it's like nobody is thinking like in California, like they have soul food like they would in like Mississippi. So Mississippi has a higher problem with, you know, uh, obesity because the culture around food is oh, yeah. different. I mean, everything's bigger in Texas. Three yeah. of the top 10 <laughs> most obese cities in the country are in yeah. Texas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, number one being Houston. Is it? Number one. Surprising. Google that shit, Luke. I would have thought. I would have thought somewhere <laughs> in like Alabama or in three uh, of the top. I mean, it's uh, you know, I'm sure there's a new list every year, but it's routinely there's three cities in Texas that are always in the top ten. Yeah, there's a lot to be said. You know, when you ha- when you're living in a place where you know, like California, it's like you can go to the mountains, you can go snowboarding, you can go to the beach. You can yeah. culturally, you know, it's a more active area. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. But I went to San Francisco once, and there was this huge. What we got. McAllen, Texas. This is a bullshit list. Where what is McAllen, <laughs> Texas? It's it's uh actually around like Fort Worth and stuff. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. But there's so Mississippi basically. for you, number two. So I, I basically that. anywhere that got soul food. Yeah. And seafood. <laughs> Bro. That's about right. This is <laughs> three in Tennessee. That's funny. My parents went, live in your chat. Last year I went alligator hunting in uh Alabama and <laughs> sorry, this is random. But the uh the place that we went it was uh, Lake Eufaula, Alabama. It was on the Georgia-Alabama uh, line. And in Ye- Lake Eufaula, we were, like, asking around because we were there for a couple of days. And I was like, hey, where's a good spot to go eat? And so we get a recommendation. They'd be like, oh, you need to go check out this place. It's over here. We'd walk in, and it was a fried food buffet. And we're like, <laughs> all right. So we'd ask somebody the next day. We're like, hey, where's a good spot to go eat? They're like, oh, you got to go try this place. That place sucks. You got to go try this place. 
same thing. We walk in, it's a fried food buffet. <laughs> and then we started realizing like, dude, this whole town is just fried food buffet. You walk in and you can feel the grease like hit your face. And they'd be like, we don't have menus. You just, it's a buffet, obviously. And you walk up there and it's just French fries and like fried, you know, shrimp. Just one price. I, yeah, they were like, it's ten ninety nine. You get the plate. It's a fried food buffet. It's it delicious. With boiled peanuts. Yeah. They had uh, one. They had one Chick Fil A in the whole town, and we we're like, I guess we're eating Chick Fil A the whole time. Real like, nuggets, God, man. <laughs> That's wow. Wes, I want to change gears because this was really like, man, what a topic. Um, you found so much mental strength uh, coming out of what you know this this tragic accident that happened, and you found all this strength from you know it seems like giving grace to people that maybe didn't deserve it in, in, in a lot of other people's minds. I want to go back to the day where you, you got to sit across the table from the person that sh- fired those bullets. What was that like? It was hard. Um, <laughs> to put a little context around it, uh, you can actually see this, uh, like this conversation uh, on Netflix's Queer Eye, because I was uh, filming my uh episode of Queer Eye. There was, a, there was the whole season where they had him in Kansas City? Yep. Is that right? So season <clears throat> season four, episode two. And, um, man, you know how I just said uh, when we think about, like, life tests you, and this is something that I knew. This is something that I knew in some sense that I wanted to do, Right. I lit. Who's vibrating? Come on, dude. I'm disturbed, bro. <laughs> Jeez, bro. Dang so, was that guy in the picture? Was he the guy that, that shot you? We can start over. Oh, I didn't see it. Mm. Okay, bring it back up. Is that you, Luke? Um, no, I don't think they put it on there. Right there? That, no, that's Karamo. That's the guy from actual, like the host, uh, one of the hosts. Uh, it's a you. They do got it on YouTube, though. Like a clip of it, um, for sure. And so um, I was filming uh, Queer Eye. It was probably the last day that we filmed. Um, And a a lot happened. Like I, um, that morning I woke up and my dad had called me about 6 a.m. and told me that one of my close cousins had passed away. And he passed away from diabetes. Um, Just got real bad and uh and we were very close before my injury. So there was a lot of sorrow um, and grief that I was feeling that day. And we had to do a lot of filming. If anyone never experienced like the film thing, like you just got to put all your problems on a back burner, um, especially if it's a, a, a deadline and cut off. And we were definitely on time. And so I tried to push it off and I had a break. And during this break, I'm like, thinking, grieving, feeling all this way. And I'm like, I'm about to do this. Like, I can't do this. I can't meet this person. Um, and I remember we getting in the car. We start having a conversation. All of this is like on the episode where we're in the car talking about the situation. I'm like, oh, it's about to happen. Because they won't tell you, like, when it's going to happen. Just like, it's, you know, it's coming. Um, and I remember um, literally, uh, like, Right before we went into uh, the location where we met, which was in downtown Kansas City, I uh, got out and went into this coffee spot, and I just called the producer and was like, nah, I can't do this. Like, I done lost my family today. Like, I ain't had time to grieve. Um, And so when you look, like, even, like, me entering the door, like, I was bothered. I wasn't bothered by knowing I was going to meet the person that put me in this position, I was just had so much on me. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I went into the coffee shop, I remember the producer just saying like, Wes, you, it said, pray about it. And I I wouldn't say that I'm like a, a fully like religious person. And so for me, it was like in this moment, like, like what I, I really thought, like, is that going to serve me? But I, I was conscious enough to say, let me do it. And I remember just sitting down at the, it was Messenger's Coffee downtown. And I remember sitting there and I'm like, I prayed, but I actually just spoke to my cousin. You know, I'm like, I don't know why you left today. And so for some reason, maybe you left because I had to do something that we don't do. This isn't something that you see on a daily basis. Like, I knew that this was like the unthinkable in a sense. Like, forgiveness is powerful. And I was authentically about to do it. 
but I was weak in the situ in the sense of the situation that I was facing during the day. And I remember just speaking. And when I rode through that door, I just felt like a weight was just lifted. And um, we just you were smiling, dude. Yeah. Like I just I I felt like I was protected, you know, and 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 of course, like it wasn't. Even the in, like where we did it at was definitely still a public area. Um, we just kind of allocated a space to do it, and that was kind of on safety precautions and stuff. Not so private. Want definitely want to be public. Um, but I just I didn't care. I just like I just knew that I was good now. Like I had did what I need to do. I showed grace. I let acknowledge my family in a sense. Like since I couldn't be with family that day, right? And I just said, I need you. I just need you today. And I sat across that table. And I mean, it was, I think it was a very powerful thing. Like, I just, I, I knew that I was good. I mean, I, I definitely wasn't nervous. I wasn't. I was just. Was the goal of the show to give you closure here? Was the goal to give this, this person the closure? So honestly, this wasn't really even a thought that they had in mind. Um, when I, at that time, when I used to share my story before I met the person, I used to always say, like, the man, I used to always speak affirmations. And I would say that the man that tried to take my life gave me life. And so during the initial interview with the producers, I had basically utilized that quote because, again, people are like, how are you so grateful for life? This happened to you. And, like, you know, and I used that affirmation. And it was a question posed, like, well, if you're that, you know, grateful, would you be willing to? meet the person that shot you and I was like yeah here's his information because again when you come from where I come from you definitely know you know mm-hmm. and so I knew who did it I knew like how to get in contact with him I shared it I didn't know like he the, didn't get arrested um he did but oh. I didn't go to court you know I didn't go like point anybody out or anything so whatever he went to jail for maybe five years probably was the most time and then he got out you know and so Again, it was just like one of those things, like very authentic, you know, and it was just like, yeah, like the producer just really felt maybe just my gratitude and just wanted to see if she could get it together. Um, And I mean, it definitely was like a mind blowing thing for everybody when it actually happened. But when I when I I speak a lot about freedom these days and I always thought, you know, through my life and circumstances, I I was never free. I was trapped. Rather, it was in a system or what. I definitely feel free now. And I I know that that level of freedom was um, amplified that day. Like, I had already freed myself from mental, you know, thoughts and, you know, things and debilitating thoughts. But this was something powerful. This was like, I don't got to look over my shoulder Right. Like, again, like I'm thriving in life at this moment, but I'm still having to be in my city where I was shot and you don't know how people feel. And so, you know, that's real. And so not only was I looking over my shoulder, the people that were close to me was. So for me, it was like you get two heads at the table and you kind of shake hands and get it over with. Like that now that's leave it to God. You know what I mean? But I don't have to feel like. I need to be concerned anymore because I got to talk to the source and tell them exactly how I feel. I understand the situation happened, but through my level of growth, I also know that I would have did the same thing if the shoe was on the other foot at that time with that mentality. That's powerful, man. Can I give it, um, can I get any kind of what his name was Maurice? Is that right? Yep. What was, uh, what was his kind of response to you that day? Um, I mean, just again, it, it was one of those things that I think if you live in a certain lifestyle, you understand. And he just basically just said he was trying to protect somebody, and it wasn't me that day. And and the best way to simplify his words, and that made sense. I mean, you don't in any situation. Sometimes you're not calling the police first, right? Like if you need somebody to come quick, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if somebody's going to lose their life or somebody's going to pull a gun out. But if I need to feel protected, I might call my big brother first, right? Like, it's just those everyday situations. And when he said that, it just made sense. Like, it just, unfortunately, it happened the way it happened. And I'm survived and I got to thrive. But 
this is a situation that we all go through, no matter race or anything, background. Like, if it's going down and I need, like, <laughs> and that's what, then that's how I kind of got it from what he said. And I just, it was the growth for me that had that level of empathy. Like, man, you did change my life. It's bad. Like, but there's so much good out of this. Like, what I get to teach people, how I get to strengthen my family now, the example I get to show my daughter beyond what I thought I could show her, like, the, the, foundation i've created like all of those values are a little bit more important than what to that's awesome man i love that you can have that mindset because it'd be very easy to let that be you know a situation that you like to find yourself and and become a victim and you know have a what was me attitude all the time and so it's just amazing how you've been able to show him grace at the same time as build yourself and who you've become now and, and be a great example for your daughter etc Absolutely. I mean, when you think like I consider myself a change agent in a lot of ways. And if I look at my life and myself, I just consider myself as a vessel. I'm not here to make my life better. I'm here to make the generations after me. And if I understand that the generations before me and even mine has issues, then the best thing I can do is be invested to the future. Right. And again, I don't need the same situations to constantly keep happening. So why won't I do something that people don't do? Right. And, and be authentic with it. Like, ain't one day I wake, walk, roll around. <laughs> There's not one day I roll around like, man, I'm mad that this person shot me. Just not one day. I do not regret this. What I probably regret is the lack of awareness that society has when it comes to disability. The barriers that I have to face through the lack of access. Because that's when I start to think about my injury. I'm not thinking about it just up and thriving and moving around. I'm thinking about it when somebody invite me to a building that only got stairs or the elevator doesn't work or the lift doesn't work. Like those are the times I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it when somebody judges me because they don't understand that I don't look disabled enough. So when I roll around in my bins and I pull up, they're judging me because I just look like a black man in a handicapped spot. Right. Like those are the things that now make me have to be concerned about my injury. But my injury, I'm good. I'm with you. So let's talk about your uh, yeah. non-for-profit, man. Let's yeah. talk about... Disabled but not really. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, like I told you, disabled but not really was kind of born in the hospital bed. And um, a lot of people always ask, you know, the name. Hey, disabled but not really. When I did that transformation, I knew that I had rose above what society and even myself perceived as disability. Like, I rose above limits, my own limits. And I wanted that name to have ownership over my identity, but also still leave room for more. Mm -hmm. And so that's what disabled but not really is. And when I first started it, it was just, man, I just want people with disabilities to be more active and healthy. Now our mission is to instill a physical limitless mindset that breeds courage, confidence, and competence. And we focus on areas of fitness, nutrition, and mental health. We have a 12-week cohort that we do two times a year um, that is completely free. Um, we hire skilled trainers um, that also have like a PT or OT background. Um, and they come and do one-on-one -on -one personal training two days a week. We do a group session with the, we normally partner with the gym in Kansas City um, to do like that social group class. Uh, we do that every Saturday. We do mental health and gratitude check-ins on Fridays through this program. Um, and then that's that. We have a nutritional seminar, like fix a perfect plate. Like we really try to dial our education. Um, and then once they finish their eight weeks, we do like a social aspect. Again, the goal isn't just to change the person, it's to change the environment and the infrastructure around them. So after that eight weeks, we feel like most individuals are pretty confident. They've been doing some things. They're ready to get out of society. But then they, they have those barriers mentally of, like, what they can do. And since we're in Kansas City, our goal is to make it inclusive. So for our next four weeks, we try to find different activities. Um, we actually found a good partnership with Blade and Timber. Um, so we'll go and get a private setting with our groups and do axe throwing That's and kind of cool. get them to challenge their strengths and stuff. And so it's pretty cool. You see an amputee. You know, and they're not maybe had their prosthetic on, but they got, got their balance and they get to throw an axe or someone in a wheelchair that might not have really had, but they get to utilize the strength that they learned in the gym. But then on top of that, um, like we've done pickleball. Um, and it's just really like, this is what I want you to do when I'm not here. 
this is what I want you to do to bring your family out. But then this is also for you to know that these people that have created this space also wants to welcome you. And they're here to kind of create this for you to figure it out, get, get you get confident in here. So now you can come in on your own. And that's also like one of the missions behind disabled, but not really. It's like, I can't just change the individual. Like it has to have a ripple effect or we're not doing our job. Like, we have to see things change because you're willing and confident to go out in society. Your community starts to invest into you. They start to invest in themselves. Like that's the purpose. And again, like, so we, our programs two times a year, I think we kind of serve about 30 individuals. Um, we do have bigger goals to expand, kind of bring our uh, alumni back where they can have like a revolving door. Um, but right now with our space and things, we just kind of have to host our 12 week programs. And then hopefully that we partner with different gyms that become inclusive enough that we can bring um, or at least kind of like do a membership program or something with that that facility out of the gyms here in Kansas City. Which one do you feel like caters best to anybody with a disability? Planet Fitness. <laughs> For real? Yeah, yeah, man. Like literally, I I think uh, probably like during my actual like bodybuilding competing days, I did Planet Fitness the most. Like um, their benches. I mean, you got to think about equipment. So a lot of people just have narrow benches, um, narrow sit- sitting spaces in general on the machines. Um, Planet Fitness is just pretty wide. You know, probably because of the demographic that they mainly try to serve, but they're way more doable. Um, outside of that, I mean, I definitely go to Genesis a lot. Um, I just like the environment sometimes, the culture of people there. Um, but if I had to recommend a gym to a person with a disability, I would actually recommend a CrossFit gym, um, something more functional fitness because you could just use your body, you know what I mean, and, and move. And so, and they, and they literally There's take their time. Scaling, scaling options so, are yeah, unlimited yeah. Adaptations with Adaptations everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And, it, yeah. And, it, and it gives you the ability to like, just, just be confident with like, yeah, like it's just that gradual. When you go to other gyms and they have the barriers of equipment. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, that was the first time. When I climbed that uh, rope in my wheelchair, it was my first time climbing. I'm like, man, I can't go down. <laughs> like, it's just going to be hard. So I yeah. just kept going up. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's wild, man. Yeah, man. Like, and, and again, it was the first the video of me, like, climbing a rope right there from the ground was the first time I ever did that. And then when I did it, I said, huh. But what people see, like, they see the wheelchair and say it's amazing. But for me, it was like, Trying to climb anything and you don't have the mobility of your legs just feels funny. Yeah. Like having something dangle down, it just feels funny. So like me putting a wheelchair was just for me to feel comfortable. Right. You know what I mean? I know it was weighted, but I don't think I thought of so much about the weight because I really, I it's dead weight, but I don't feel it. Yeah. So like if I'm doing pull-ups and stuff, like, man, how you do it? I'm like, I literally in my mind only feel my upper body. Mm-hmm. Like everything below that just feels like you know, it might have weight to it, but it don't feel like it for me. And oh, that's the kind of thing with the wheelchair. So it's like I get to feel the weight of my legs when I have my wheelchair attached. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there as far as is adaptive divisions, you know, obviously the, the Olympia has a really good adapted uh, wheelchair division. Um, I think that they're really well represented down through the MPC on the local level. Um and then CrossFit, you know, CrossFit's so segmented up that I think they have, what? how many different adapted uh, categories do they have? I mean, I feel like they represent every category when it comes to disability, which yeah. is phenomenal. They have like lower extremity, below the knee, then yeah, above neuro, the knee. Yeah, neuro. It's like developmental. Like I definitely, like there's definitely a gym, a box down in Texas. Um, they call their gr- group the Kinetic Kids. And it's mm-hmm. just a whole group of uh Children with Down syndrome. I mean, and well, I did a competition with them, and we teamed up. And it was just like one. But, again, like, you don't see that in, like, your normal everyday gym. You see it in places that actually speak community. Yeah. And, fortunately, that's more of your CrossFit setting and those environments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just uh, it's it's good to see that, you know, there are gyms out there that are, you know, gyms and then also organizations that, you know, from the top down are looking not only at just, you know, uh, groups that, you know, they can get together, you know, from a CrossFit standpoint, but also, you know, people that are competing at a high level, which is always super fun to watch, you know? Uh, no, absolutely. I, I didn't even know about the 
the competing until like just getting into my own fitness journey and filming myself and someone finally got in my dms like have you ever heard of this and i'm like nope (laughs) and i just got on it and so for me like even competing in crossfit like i did it for years i mean i did it to the point where um like man i was featured in men's health magazine and i did some stuff on the kansas city star like it was big accomplishments yeah but a lot of it was like i was empowered every time i went like it wasn't just about the community but when i competed like you said earlier, all those different divisions, right? Like in uh, classes of like disability. So I didn't have to go and just work and compete against a person with a spinal cord injury. Like I could go and watch um, an amputee or like we were talking earlier about my guy, uh, Casey, um, just with the one. Wow. Right. Like and, and those individuals empower me. So it, it was one of those things for me was like as I went and competed, I got to see the strength of other disabilities too. Like I didn't have to focus just on mine anymore. Like I, I, like for my own journey made me go and just think I could go empower people in wheelchairs. Yeah. Me having the experience of seeing other people that represent disability, rather was an amputee or someone with cerebral palsy to MS. Right. Like now I have a different level of knowledge, not only just into the way that I empathize with them, but even how I serve through my organization. Yeah. So now it's like we get to expand because I've seen that representation they might need for sure. Right. Like that's where it's like that experience, like through that experience now through my organization, I get to like, I get somebody come in with disability. I'm like, "Ah, I know somebody, right. Like I get to literally do this tag team in a sense to have where you have a visual mentor or someone that represents your disability. So now you get to be motivated instead of being like, Oh man, God in a wheelchair don't know how to help me. I'm, you know, I I got one leg. Like, yeah, no, but I know somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And now you get inspired and now we get to work off each other. Right. Like, yeah. and so that's the best way to, for, that's just kind of amplifying like the service, but all of it come from like just that experience. Do you, have you ever seen the uh, documentary murder ball? Yep. Isn't that a sick documentary? That was the first time that I ever saw like high level, uh, like people competing in, in something that was like, physical you know what i'm saying oh man rugby is brutal it's crazy okay? dude listen dude I they're, run, that. they're running freaking wheelchairs into one <laughs> another at like freaking top speeds i'm just hey, like dude i tried that maybe twice you yeah. know we have a team here in kansas city and like i tried it twice and i'm not gonna lie to you man i leave that up to the quads man like, yeah Cause they just banging you out, dog. Like I, <laughs> I still go fall over here a little bit. Like yeah. it's fun, but nah, that ain't my sport. Like yeah. I tell people, I, like I can't do any. I'm not doing every sport. I would do fitness because it's going it, overall creates a better quality of life. Like you seeing me pull up something off the ground might look amazing, but for me that gave me confidence to do my own grocery shopping. Yeah, right. Like. And that's something that maybe I didn't have when I couldn't put pick that twenty five kettlebell off the ground. Yeah. Right. So it's like everything that I do in a sense when it comes to fitness is implemented into a lifestyle thing. So learning how to lift overhead. I mean, my max set was two hundred. I think I did a two hundred overhead press. You know, like, and um, somebody was like, "Man, you know, that was pretty dope." I was like, "No, what was dope was that I did it while I was in my regular chair. So I learned how to balance without tipping back, but I also learned how to balance with 200 pounds over my head, right? So now I don't question myself if I got to go put something in the cabinet up high. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's right? functional. It, it's all applicable to your life. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And so that's kind of how you – That's just, I don't, I'm not doing dumb workouts. Yeah. I'm not doing nothing that's not going to bring me quality of life. Like I, I want to have longevity. And so if I want to have longevity, then everything I do is actually something that can bring me value. I'm not going to do something that just looks pretty cool. Like I climb ropes, but I'm not doing them all the time no more. Right. Like as long as I know I can climb it, and I can stay fit to climbing it. I'm not going to do it where one day I, I slip or fall or have an accident. Like I'm I don't need to make it look cool for Instagram lights. Like this is my life. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool, man. I love your story, man. You're, it's it's super inspiring and, you know, getting to talk to somebody who has such a different perspective and has gone through, you know, basically such a, such a you know, tough situation and came out on the other side of it such a, in a such positive influence for people is, it's inspiring, man. Yeah, it's one thing to, uh, you know what I'm saying, to invest in yourself like you have, but the amount of other people's lives that you've touched and that have you, you've bettered because of this instance um, is incredible. The amount of people that you, you know, the ripple effects of this 
has hit so many other people, touched so many other people's lives, and it continues to. Now, you, you motivational speak as well. Yeah, when's, man. When's your, when's, <laughs> when's your next engagement? Um, oh, let me think. April. Okay. I'm in April. I <laughs> I get booked and busy. I'm, it might be sooner than that, but I definitely feel like April. Um, I'll be in Texas, actually. Um if someone wanted to book you, how would they best get a hold of you? Absolutely. They just go to my website. It's WesleyHamilton.life. Love that. Awesome, yeah. man. <laughs> we, got one, we got one last question for you because uh, you're a Kansas City born and raised, and uh, this is a Kansas City-based podcast, so we ask all of our guests this question. One place to eat barbecue in Kansas City, what's your favorite? Oh. Can we get one? <laughs> oh. Mm, mm, mm. I'd just say Jack Stack, man. It's a good choice. Probably the most popular answer, right? <laughs> it, is, it is the most popular answer. I haven't had any bad experience with Jack Stack. Uh, They're yeah. phenomenal, man. You have a favorite spot? They got a lot of locations. Um, The Plaza does good with their lamb. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I definitely like the Plaza for the lamb. But Lee Summit is like a chill spot for me. Actually, all of them, man. They all got their own thing. Oh, yeah, they're all yeah, depending yeah. on where I'm at. But Jack Stack. I'm not. Crazy. I'm not a super fan of Overland Park. Like if I'm in that area, I'd rather just go down to Martin City personally. But I, I think I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever. Where's been the Jack Stack Park? Park? It's on. Uh, uh, it's just north Antioch. of uh, 435 on uh, Metcalf. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know exactly what you're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Kind of by the well, Genesis over there. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Anyways, dude, thank you for doing the podcast, man. Like I said, you know, you super inspiring story and in, uh, in what you're doing is is awesome, man. We really look up to you and what you're doing, man. Man, you know, if I, and I appreciate that because I think if anyone can take something from my story, it's just that we have to be the change we wish to see in the world. Everything that we look at and all the issues, they don't get resolved if someone don't take the initiative to create a new solution to the problem. Rather, it's your health. Rather, it's how you feel. Rather, it's the environment around you. Like, if it's dirty, go clean it up, right? Like, if there's someone that you complain about that's hungry, go feed them. Like, it's things that we can do. It's just random acts of kindness and human dignity that we can shift change. Like, for me, my motivation was that, man, I go get a $10 Planet membership, Planet Fitness membership, and go serve someone with that additional, like, plus one, right? Yeah. And that's all I needed. You don't think too big to change, yeah. right? Just change yourself, and the world starts to change around you. Personal responsibility, man. It's very awesome. Very well, awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks yeah. again for your time, Wes. Yep. Thanks, buddy. Absolutely.